everyone. Welcome back to the Free Radicals podcast. I'm Will, your host. I'm Robin. Hi. In the last episode, we talked about the uh, the build up in Munster in the in the year or so before uh, things start to to really ramp up, uh, culminating in the baptism of Bernard Rothman and many of the other leaders in the town. Mm. It's just interesting to think about how all these people really affect us even still to this day. Mm -hmm. What would we do or how would we react? I can see why you like this story so much. Great. Yeah, well, uh, we were talking about some of the, the power dynamics of uh, things sort of changing. Bernard Rothman is in control, but then these uh, missionaries come and baptize Rothman. Is he still in control? Are the missionaries in control? Whose movement is this really? Mm -hmm. uh, Jan Mathis, before these baptisms happen, uh, in many ways appoints himself as the successor of Melchior Hoffman. Mm -hmm. And uh, Melchior Hoffman was doing all of the things that we would expect uh, a, a prophet, uh, an apocalyptic preacher in this movement to be doing. He's, uh, he's preaching against the corruption of Rome. He's, he's calling people to be baptized. He's making predictions about when Jesus is coming back, mm -hmm. all of these things. Uh, but also, one of the things that had happened is Melchior Hoffman had stopped baptizing people uh, before before all of this happened. So this goes back to 1531. Mm -hmm. So we're going back a little bit. The baptisms that we ended the last episode with happened in 1533 at the very beginning of the year. Okay. So in 1531, Melchior Hoffman gets to Amsterdam and he's preaching and he baptizes a group of people. Mm -hmm. And they're excited. They uh, have this passionate faith. And uh, one of them is, is convinced not only to be baptized, but of the impending suffering of mm. the elite, all of the things that come with this kind of end times teaching. Okay. This is, this is reported. It gets to the authorities who don't want this kind of thing to be happening. Hey, so sorry, this guy who wants to be baptized is also believes that all these bad things are going to happen. What are, right. what are they upset about? The baptism or about the, the fact that this guy thinks bad things are going to happen? Well, the baptism. Mm -hmm. uh, because of the the way that this is an act against the established proper Catholic Church. Okay. So uh, this guy is baptized and, and everybody else, as soon as they hear something's happening, uh, they, they disappear. But the authorities find this one guy and he's so convinced that he's going to, about to be a martyr he's going to wear the martyr's crown oh my. which isn't a comfortable term for us so he turns himself in to the police oh my and uh they sort of expect him to escape mm. so they said okay well go to that prison over there and turn yourself in hoping he'll mm. have clarity of mind but he goes to the prison he turns himself in and uh, they ask him, well, who baptized you? Who was baptized with you? He gives all of the names. Oh, no. And uh, Melchior Hoffman gets away. But uh, even though the mayor's wife, the mayor of Amsterdam, finds out about this, sends the message out, it gets to these people. They still can't quite get away in time. They're all arrested. They're all killed for their beliefs. Uh, the the authorities think this is ridiculous, unnecessary. Mm -hmm. uh, these are not educated, wealthy people. Because of the Edict of Spire we talked about that says you can kill in a Baptist mm -hmm. and claim their property, these 10 people are killed, their property is seized, but there's no property of any value mm -hmm. to be claimed because they're all poor. So the authorities just see this as this unfortunate thing. This shouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. And even Melchior Hoffman, he looks at the situation, he finds out these people he's just baptized, he's just worshipped and prayed with and cried with them. They've now all been killed. And he realizes, we can't keep doing this, something has to change. So he says he's not baptizing anyone for two years. He's going to pause. Okay, and sorry, what was the, you said the, um, the mayor's wife of Amsterdam, like how did she get brought into this? Just that well, she knew about it? Yeah, so the 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 need to arrest these people would have gone to the mayor's house. Then he would have sent that message out to whatever equivalent of the police were there, and she would have 
presumably seen it before that happened. That's that's not her job, but she saw this, was horrified that this was going to happen. So there's something in history that talks yeah. about the mayor's wife having right. an opinion about this. Oh, I see. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so uh, this pause continues even though uh, Melchior Hoffman is in Strasbourg, because this is in, in the Netherlands. The pause happens even though Melchior Hoffman is in prison. Um, but back in the Netherlands, all of these people uh, trying to fill this leadership vacuum start thinking, okay, maybe we need to end this moratorium on baptisms. Okay. So Jan Mathis has this revelation that he's the new Enoch, one of the witnesses mm -hmm. of the end times. And he starts having these gatherings where he has sort of a double agenda. The first one is to convince the people that he's the new Hoffman. He's the new leader. And the second one is to convince the people that they need to be baptized as soon as possible. So he's doing this. He's going from city to town, uh, from secret church to secret church, preaching, baptizing, and, and kind of resuming this movement under Hoffman, but also starting his own. And uh, it's it's this bizarre uh, situation where uh, this movement is obviously happening. It's growing. We don't really know what he said, how mm -hmm. he convinced people. Yeah. Uh, but he would show up and uh, he, he had kind of a, almost the song and dance that he did. You know, he would talk about his vivid, colorful uh, visions that he had that demonstrated he was... He was one of the last witnesses of, of the apocalypse. Uh, and he would also call down curses from heaven on anyone who would disagree with this appointment. Oh, dear. Okay. So very convincing for people who are of that mindset, apparently. Hmm. And uh, people had been hearing about what was happening in Munster. They were excited to see the progress that was being made, how close this was to their own understanding. So Jan Mathis, who's gone around, baptized people, he's, he's gathered uh, students, followers who are copying his example. And he sends two of these guys, uh, Bartholomew Bookbinder and uh, Willem de Kuyper. He sends them to Munster. They get to Munster, like I mentioned at the end of episode four. They explain who they are, who they're coming from. They... They explain uh, the way that all of this needs to happen. There needs to be baptisms. Um, how Jan Mathis is the new Enoch. The mm -hmm. end of the world is coming soon. Mm -hmm. And all of them agree to be baptized. Even though, right, there's, there's plenty of reasons not to be baptized. Right? The, the Edict of Spire says that you can kill, arrest, torture, seize property from Anabaptists. Uh, and then even though Jan Mathis himself wasn't there, uh, Melchior Hoffman obviously wasn't there. Uh, Bernard Rothman was in charge. He was there, but he was receiving baptism, not giving it. So there's plenty of reasons for them not to get baptized, but they're carried away. We can only imagine what these emissaries said. So you said everyone got baptized. Like... In, in There was a gathering that happened at Bernard Nipperdoling's house. So everyone at that gathering got baptized. And how many people was that? Yeah, like around 10 or 12. Okay. Um, Heinrich Roll, who was one of the preachers in this movement, was baptized. Nipperdoling, Rothman. There's a, a priest named uh, Stopraid who uh, we mentioned in the last episode had been asked to baptize children and said he didn't want to. There was a group of guys called the Wassenberg Preachers. They were all baptized there. So Rothman was baptized there? Yeah. But wasn't he already baptized? No. Like, all of them had been baptized as children right, properly yeah. in the Catholic Church. And, and even though they had agreed that they would no longer baptize children, they hadn't together taken that next step of being oh, baptized themselves. Okay. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's kind of a logical jump that needs to happen. When you reject the baptism of children in general, you're also rejecting your own baptism as a child. 
yeah, that, first, that yeah. jump doesn't happen automatically. Okay. And when that sinks in, then there is a call. Yes, we do need to be baptized. Let's do this I see. together. Mm, interesting. And they didn't stop there. So the, the, the emissaries arrive. This baptism happens in early January. Uh, by the end of the month, Bernard Rothman and Heinrich Roll have gone around and they have baptized 1,400 adults. Oh my goodness. What? Which is roughly a That's quarter insane. of the population of the city. So this isn't a, a small thing. This isn't just a small study groups. Mm. This is a revival. And is this full immersion baptism or how are they doing it? It's a good question. Uh, there are churches now that have a lively debate on how baptism should mm. happen. Mm -hmm. In recent memory, especially Mennonite brethren churches have emphasized full immersion baptism. Mm -hmm. uh, other churches, like the ones that I've spent more time in, uh, baptized by sprinkling. The, the early baptisms in Zurich that we talked about would have been by sprinkling. They were indoors. Oh, really? It was uh, January in Zurich. There's no way anybody was going to the river oh, okay. to be baptized. So these baptisms were done, those baptisms were done by sprinkling. Um, but Jan Mathis had a different style of baptism. For Jan Mathis, mm -hmm. a baptism wasn't just a sign of confession. It, it was that. Uh, it wasn't just a, a sign of a commitment to God. It was also marking people because Jesus mm. was coming back and was going to take 144,000 right. people with him to heaven. Right. And so the prophets of the end times, the Enoch and Elijah, needed to mark people for that identification. Right. So he would put water on his fingers and mark the sign of the cross or the mm -hmm. letter T, a mm -hmm. Greek tau, on the foreheads of people, presumably so that when Jesus came back, he could recognize those who had been marked for the yeah, end okay. of the world. And uh, to, to be baptized, the people had to reject certain things. And we talked about this earlier in the in the process but they were asked to reject the world all ostentation the devil and all desires of the flesh such as gluttony drinking whores and the clerical abominations of the papists uh, which is a fancy collection of words um, but rejecting wanton sexuality and the the greed and empty rituals of the Catholic Church. Those are side by side. Yeah, interesting. Hmm. What's ostentation mean? Um, yeah, ostentation is uh, sort of a fake piety, a fake image, like uh, having a, a false sense of yourself in front of other people okay. to be in, impress the crowds. Um, and one of the questions that uh, that comes up as as part of this is, uh, what is the church? When, mm. when we talk about the church, we mean specific things, yeah. right? So uh, when we talk about my church, mm -hmm. right, then we talk about the the people that I gather with on Sunday morning, right? Uh, and and maybe even uh, although not theologically correct we might mean the building that we gather right. in okay right or a, a global mm -hmm. group of people who, who follow jesus right uh, there's there's a greek root uh, the greek word translated as church in the new testament uh, would mean the assembly and, and some would say that the called out assembly okay uh, the ecclesia uh, have you thought about that word church? What uh, what else does that mean to you, or what has that meant to you in the past? Mm, yeah, church for me just meant um, the people gathering, so it did definitely did not mean a building. Um, and I definitely felt that my church, that there was only one true church, and mm -hmm. that the group I was a part of was the church, and that. I guess other things just were not the church. Right. I mean, isn't there a scripture that talks about the bridegroom being the church as well? Right. 
Yeah, so there's there are passages that that speak about Jesus as the groom, right, um, and the church as the bride. The church collectively right. is is the bride, um, who will be inevitably reunited. Right. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> there there are questions that historians and theologians ask uh, about this term church. So when when people would say that Martin Luther or or any of these reformers were destroying the church. Mm. What did they mean by that? Right. It sort of means uh, there's a there's a unity of the church, and these questions, this opposition, that's destroying the unity. So we aren't collectively as strong. Mm. Uh, and and some people would say, well, you're taking people out of the church by f- deceiving them with false teaching. Mm. Uh, but now we would say, well, yeah, there was the Catholic Church, right. and now there was the Lutheran Church added to yeah. that, right? So then the church isn't harmed because it's just divided into two different churches right. that get to grow and thrive in their own in their own way. But then there was only one church, right? I see. Uh, that's interesting. Yeah. So within Bernard Rothman's early teaching. There's sort of an understanding that the whole city is the church. Oh, okay. Right? There would have been uh, people who didn't believe. Maybe there were Jews living in Munster, etc. But uh, everyone pretty much was assumed to be Christian. Mm. And that to build up the church, the leaders, like Rothman, had to get their stuff together. They had to preach better. They had to encourage better. Mm. Uh, so then they were building up the church, and by that they meant the spirituality of the whole city. Okay. Uh, but with the the adult baptisms that happen in this story, then there's kind of a different understanding of church. That church is only those people who have taken seriously the call to follow Jesus. So then in their minds, then, the church is only Mm. those people who've made that decision. Right. Which, to us, sounds and feels arrogant. Because, well, just because they go to different churches, they can't agree with you. But part of it is, um, like, already, this is uh, very early January when this baptism happens. And this didn't go unnoticed. The The bishop, uh, Franz von Waldeck, heard about this, was not happy about this. There had been other adult baptisms nearby. And even in uh, what they call Munsterland, so the, mm. the area around the city, people who had been baptized as adults had already been arrested and executed. Oh, dear. So for the Anabaptist Christians in Munster... It's, it's hard for them to accept this universal understanding of the church when other Christians are killing them. Yeah, of right? course. The, yeah. the Anabaptists in Munster probably knew the Anabaptists who had been executed yeah. outside of the city. Yeah, of course. Right? They, or they certainly knew the preachers, missionaries, who had gone out and performed those baptisms. Mm-hmm. Right? So... They are uh, purifying the church uh, by ensuring it's only the right people who take it seriously that are joining the church. So would the people who have done the executions also consider themselves um, Christians? Yeah, and probably would have thought they were doing God and the church a service by removing the people whose teaching was bad, whose understanding of God and the church was, was bad. Okay, but what, like, where would they base that scripture on? Somewhere in the Old Testament? Yeah, um, and and part of that's part of the pick and choose nature of, of, of Christian life, really, right? Because at one point Jesus says, uh, "Whoever is not with me is against me." But in another passage, he says, um, "Hey, if." Uh, if you're not against me, you're with me, <laughs> which you can't, it feels like you can't really have both at the same time. Mm. Uh, so if, if you're looking for justification, uh, then you can kind of find it. Wow. 
so they were following the bishop's orders um right so these missionaries when they got to munster they wouldn't have had to work too hard to communicate the corruption of the catholic church right, right? he could say who's who's going to rescue you the the bishop the previous bishop died of alcohol poisoning at the party where he was supposed to be installed as your spiritual leader mm. that's who's going to rescue you yeah. right so there's it's it's easy to pick and choose examples of the corruption of the other side yeah and that's part of the the problem of this whole story is it's it's so easy for them and convenient for them to see that mm -hmm. uh, see the errors on the other side of that uh, so a week after that first set of baptisms, uh, there's a few more emissaries that come from Jan Mathis Garrett Bookbinder, same last name as Bartholomew, mm -hmm. and uh, Jan van Leiden, who will be an important person later on in the story. So I was saying how uh, this movement hadn't gone unnoticed. There were these executions outside of the city, and on top of that, uh, the, the bishop was starting to strategize about how he would control this okay. outbreak of um, yeah. Anabaptism. And uh, this, this kind of builds up and people are starting to uh, think with, with good reason that the bishop is building an army okay. to attack the city. Wow. And uh, when you think about these Anabaptists being executed. Mm -hmm. When you think about the struggle for power mm -hmm. uh, between the Catholics and the, the Lutherans, all of these things are, are making it more plausible. So there are lots of reasons to understand why the bishop would be building up an army, right. but also reasons to understand why everybody would be afraid of this yeah, of course. Uh, uh, as a, as a mm -hmm. possibility. So things start to ramp up on February 8th. So it's only a, a month after these early baptisms. And uh, on this date, a, a group of Anabaptists maybe kind of carried away with the, the tension around this impending attack, mm -hmm. building up of an army, start preaching for repentance. There's just uh, a long list of, of people in the city shouting in the streets oh, wow. and in the churches about the need for repentance oh, my. young old women men uh, rich poor leaders mm. common people this it just the whole city is is filled with people mm. shouting for repentance wow so that's a sunday and then on uh on monday it gets even stranger so already there was a fear that the bishop was building up an army uh but now there's a rumor that there's an army of 3,000 soldiers already on the way. Okay. And the Anabaptists, of course, are terrified. Yeah. Because this is certain death for them. Right, of course. And it just so happens that on this day, the city council is meeting. Okay. So the, the Anabaptist crowd reaches out to city council and says you have to do something about this because they're yeah. they're going to attack us anytime right but the city council doesn't do anything about it instead they try to figure out where this rumor came from so they find the guy that started the rumor mm -hmm. and they ask him they get information from him and it doesn't seem credible to them okay so then they don't do anything okay but the crowd has already become convinced. You yeah. can't reassure yeah. an entire crowd. Right. So they are, again, preaching to each other and anyone else who will listen about the need for repentance. And the city council doesn't know what to do because uh, this crowd, who was otherwise peaceful, but they believed an army was yeah. coming. So they started to... Uh, equip themselves with weapons that they could oh. use if they were being attacked. Okay. So the council sees this as a threat to their safety. Yeah. So then they retreat to a different part of the city across the river mm -hmm. from the rest of the city. And uh, the Anabaptist tension is growing because they think uh, the councillors are going to get uh, support from the Catholics mm -hmm. and then 
the Anabaptists start to build up protections, not just against the Catholic army, but about against the counselors who are on the other side of the river now. Okay. So by now, enough time has passed that it's clear the rumor is not true. The army would have arrived oh, by I see. now. Okay. But they're still expecting something is going to happen. So they're waiting. They, they're trying to figure out what they should do next. Um, they're waiting for leadership. Jan Mathis hasn't arrived yet. Uh, Bernard Rothman is a leader, but he hasn't made any pronouncements. They're, they're waiting for discernment, and then something magical happens. <laughs> or as the crowd determines it to be magical. Uh, the history books say that three suns appeared in the sky. Oh, sun dogs. Yeah, so here on the prairie provinces of Canada, this is a phenomenon we see from time mm. to time. We call it sun dogs. There's a scientific explanation mm. that we can give that might have been beyond what the common people yeah. of 1534 could have understood. Mm -hmm. Some of them might have remembered, no, this is a thing that happens from time to time. Mm. But in this crowd, fearing an impending yeah. attack, actively, fervently praying to God for protection, yeah. they see this and it is a sign. A sign of what? A sign of a long list of things that, that God is going to protect them. Okay. That things are going to work out, that the end is near, any and all of those okay. things. Um, but also, this because this was such a turning point in the story, this is what I designed the logo based mm -hmm. on. Yeah, I was wondering about that. So, yeah, that's what it's <coughs> sort of supposed to be. Mm. That, uh, you know, these days, climate and whatever... Uh, this is an incredibly rare phenomenon in in Germany. Mm -hmm. Relatively common here. You, once or twice a year, you'll, yeah. you'll see it. Um, but even relatively rare at that time because people weren't expecting this. Right. So you have this crowd preaching repentance, crying out to God for help, and they see what they think is a sign from God. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the council sees this crowd arming themselves. So the the Anabaptist crowd is afraid of the council right. and the Catholics. The council is afraid of the Anabaptist right. crowd and the Catholics. Right? And and the Catholics are are there and they don't quite know what's going on, but they're ready to intervene. So the the city council says this is gonna get out of hand. We need help. So they call the bailiff. Who works for the bishop mm -hmm. and uh, the bailiff comes uh, sees the situation reassures the counselors that yes the city has independence um, but we we can intervene so then they they call for backups okay to establish order and uh, the Anabaptist crowd they find out about this they're terrified and then the city councilors start thinking, wait a second, if the bishop comes and, and takes over to establish order, he's not just going to leave mm -hmm. right away. Yeah. So they're not sure that they want the bishop to come. And already the councilors have started um, marking their houses because, they, okay, we're inviting the the bishop to send in an army, but we don't want our houses to be destroyed. So they start oh. marking their houses differently. The Anabaptists see this, right? This is biblical stuff, right? This is mm. Exodus stuff. So that increases the tension. But the counselors, they realize, wait a second, we don't want to lose our grip on power because it'll all disappear right. as soon, the moment the soldiers get here. So they reach out to the Anabaptist leaders they reassure them, listen, we can work things out. Mm -hmm. We don't need the Catholics involved. Uh, we will protect you. We will tolerate you. We'll give you the freedom to worship the way that you want to, as long as you promise to live peacefully. Mm -hmm. So they work out an agreement, and then they send the message to the Catholics. We don't need any help. Everything's fine. Okay. But everybody is still a little bit on edge. Mm -hmm. um, the the bishop has has started to um, collect forces for a siege oh. um, to attack the city. So a, a siege is when you surround a city so that no food or supplies can come in or out. 
You starve out the people until they're desperate, and then you can just attack. Mm. So that's what the bishop wants to do. And uh, they're starting to build up these uh, forces. The people in the city, especially people with money, they realize, okay, when, when this attack happens, they're not going to try to figure out who are the Anabaptists and who are the Lutherans and who are the Catholics. They're going to kill everybody, especially the men, and destroy all the stuff just to establish order. So the men leave. A lot of the men leave. Not all of them. A lot, but especially the Lutheran and Catholic men, they leave, trusting that the invading army isn't going to kill the women and children. They'll just kill the Anabaptists, establish order, and everything goes back to normal. Okay. Yeah. So it it's terrible. <laughs> um, but not not mm -hmm. only is this selfish, not only is this uh, morbid, uh, but what happens is that all of this feeds itself. So as these people are leaving, well, then the balance of power is now in the hands of the Anabaptists. Right. So on Ash Wednesday, there's a new election every year. They had elections oh, for wow. city council. Mm -hmm. Well, all the Lutherans have left. Right. All the Catholics have left. Okay. Not all. Most of them had left. <laughs> So most of the Lutherans, most of the Catholics had left. Mm -hmm. So when it's time for the elections, the dominant voice is the Anabaptist, including Bernard Nippertol, and who we talked about before, has been rebaptized. Okay. So the siege is still there, uh, and in fact, they're gathering more soldiers. The tension among the Anabaptists is growing because they feel this attack is imminent. And the calls for repentance have not stopped. In fact, they've amped up. And because of a vision that somebody has, they decide uh, we need to purify the city. So we should only have adults who have been baptized. Oh, okay. So the Adults who are left who have not been baptized either have to agree to be baptized or get kicked out. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens. Uh, we don't know quite how many accepted baptism, uh, how many left, but there's roughly 8,000 people in, in the city after this uh, exodus okay. of Does that of people. include kids? Yes, oh. in, including women and children. And okay. more women and children by far than men because right. the women have stayed behind trusting that things will work out. <laughs> or maybe they just stayed behind because they didn't have a choice. They weren't invited. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So I said most of the Lutherans had left. There was a guy and his name was Hubert Ruscher. And he stayed. He had some connections to power. For some reason, he didn't think things were as bad as they were. <laughs> And so he had spoken openly about how he thought the Dutch leaders, by that he meant Jan Mathis, mm -hmm. Jan van Leiden, who had arrived recently, how he believed that they were possessed by the devil. Oh. Well, these men had a lot of power, and so this guy, Hubert Ruscher, was arrested for this. Okay. And uh, the next day they parade him out into the public square so that he can apologize for what he said. Well, he's not interested in doing that. So, Jan van Leiden has an inspiration, a divine inspiration, and he's so full of holy anger, he he grabs a sword and lunges at Hubert Ruscher. It, it wounds him. It doesn't kill him. Uh, he's terrified. The crowd doesn't know what to do because this has never happened before. And they take Ruscher away back to prison to protect him. Well, Ruscher dies from this attack, and it's becoming increasingly clear this is who is in charge. Mm. Van Leiden is in charge. Mathis is in charge. But obviously, they're not um, like Anabaptists in the way we'd understand them as far as like being peace oriented. Right. Yeah. So. Uh, when, when we talk about Anabaptism today, the Mennonite right. movement, we, we tie a lot of our identity to the Schleitheim Confession of 1527. 
okay. when we're talking about historical connections. Yeah. And one of the points of that was that we, as Anabaptists, are people of peace. Right. Yeah, so we, we reject the sword and we reject the expectations of conformity to the state. Uh, but when you take over a city, like the Anabaptists have done in Munster, uh, you, you can't really reject the state anymore because in many ways you are the state. Mm -hmm. But the emphasis on apocalyptic thinking, the emphasis on prophetic leaders, means that what they feel in the moment now all of a sudden has sway. Right. So if Jan van Leiden, one of the leaders of the movement, feels a, a divine vision that he's supposed to inflict physical harm on this guy, mm -hmm. who is the crowd to disagree? Right, I see. Right, and, and the crowd is trying to figure out who's in charge, just like Ruscher is trying to decide who's in charge here, because these guys are crazy, right? Jan Mathis has this prophetic authority. Bernard Rothman still has the authority of an established preacher. Jan van Leiden is demonstrating uh, not only he's, he's a student, the, the main student of Jan Mathis, um, but he's also, uh, he speaks the local language, the local dialect of, of German. There's a credibility that he has. All of these men have leadership. And within the confusion of an apocalyptic Christian community, they'll figure it out. So was there three main leaders at that time? Yeah, like there were uh, there were more. Bernard Nipperdoling, who we've talked about, had a lot of authority as well. Mm -hmm. um, but a lot of it hinged on the apocalyptic visions of Jan Mathis. Mm -hmm. So he was the main leader. Interesting. Uh, but another thing that he had done that we haven't talked about a lot so far is he had predicted that the end of the world was coming on Easter Sunday of 1534. Oh. Which is not far from this time already. So the baptisms happen in January, the confusion and chaos and the elections happen in February. Then uh, March is, that's Lent. Then early April is already Easter. Then this one he thinks it's going to end. Yes. So Easter Sunday, the morning of Easter Sunday comes, the sun rises, and it's no different than any day. Right. So Jan Mathis takes 12 of his men, and they mount their horses, they open the gate, and they march, uh, uh, they, they ride the horses out in an attack on the besieging forces. Like they're almost trying to create the end of the world? <laughs> that's the question. <laughs> uh, Suicide or something? So yeah, that's the question. Uh, it could be that because nothing was happening, Jan Mathis thought that by demonstrating his faithfulness, mm -hmm. he could bring about yeah, the end of the world. I can see that. Uh, part of it is, right, the same scriptures that talk about the two witnesses of the end of the world. Talk about how they need to suffer and die. Mm. So maybe this is him volunteering for that. Okay. Right? Maybe he was so carried away in his prophetic understanding of who he was, he thought that God would rescue him and join the forces and bring about the end through this action. So what happened? He was chopped to pieces. <laughs> All of them were. What? What? This guy that is the big leader guy that you were just talking about? Well, there were massive, there was a massive army built up who were sitting around doing nothing, waiting for some action. Finally, this guy comes out. It's easy pickings. They're easily destroyed. He's not a trained fighter. He's not anything. He's killed. So parts of his body are stuck to the city gates and the whole crowd, the city watched this happen and they have to figure out what's happening next. Wow. That was a short run, Jan. Yeah, so he had a lot of authority, a lot of power. He's only in Munster for about two months. But in some ways he was right. He dies. Like he met the Lord on Easter Sunday. He was right for himself, at least. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we'll continue off from there in a few weeks, and uh, we'll get to hear the rest of, of this chaotic story. Mm.
So thanks for following along. Thanks to you, the listener. And uh, thank you. Yeah. So you can follow along on uh, various social media options. We have uh, a Facebook page. Uh, we have a website. We have um, an Instagram account. You can follow along there. Thanks for being here. <laughs> Thanks for following along. We'll see you soon. Bye.